Hello, there I am. If you will turn your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1, we are continuing our series, Alive in Christ, looking at uh, the, the, the New Testament epistle of Colossians. And tonight we're going to be looking at verses 20 through 23 of chapter 1. Well, it was a summer day in 2015 in Charleston, South Carolina. And a young man walks into a church. He is greeted by their greeters and welcomed by their members. And that night he joined a Bible study with the members of that church. But as the Bible study went on, it became abundantly clear that this man's intentions were not to learn the Word of God that night. In the middle of this Bible study, he pulls out a handgun and open fires at all who were in attendance, wounding some and killing nine. And he even attempted to take his own life, but he ran out of ammunition. And weeks later, as um, investigations were made and this man was taken into custody, he was brought on to trial for his heinous actions. And the family members and the witnesses to this awful, tragic event are to take the stand. They are to witness against this man who had viciously taken the lives of those who they loved most. But what they did was a shock to everyone. One by one, as each of these witnesses took the stand, instead of taking this opportunity and this platform to yell and berate this man who had, by all intents and purposes, committed the worst act possible to another human being, taking their lives. They had every right to be angry, every right to be bitter, but one by one, as they each took the stand, they took the platform to tell this man that they forgave him and issued and pleaded with him to repent of his sin and to turn to Christ. Well, naturally, this very countercultural event caught the, the attention of everyone in the nation, This became national news. Maybe some of you who are older in the room remember this. This was known as the Charleston Church shooting of 2015. It became national news because of what happened at that trial. That instead of getting angry and instead of getting bitter toward this man, they took the opportunity to tell them they forgave him and begged and pleaded with him that he would repent of his sin and turn to Christ. This is by all means absolutely countercultural. This is by all means and, and by every understanding really a counterhuman nature. And yet what it is is, is a, a wonderful uh, testimony to the work of Christ in the lives of these believers. But really as we take, back, we take a step back and we look at the broader scheme of, of Scripture, truly this is what God has done with each and every one of us. Though we are sinners in rebellion against him, he was the one who initiated reconciliation with us. And not only did he initiate reconciliation, he is the one who accomplished it. And so our text tonight is all about this theme of reconciliation. We began last week, part one, God's goal of reconciliation. And in part one, verses 15 to 19, we saw the preeminence of the Son, And this week, as we look at verses 20 to 23, what we're going to see is the sacrifice of the Son. The title of this message is God's Goal for Reconciliation, the Sacrifice of the Son. And in in Colossians chapter 1, verses 20 to 23, we see God's plan of reconciliation. We see our need for it and also the means of it so that you and I would be able to worship God and increase in our love for him because, he has, because of what he has done for us through the Son. And so you have your Bibles open. We will read our text for this evening, verses 20 to 23. The Word of God reads, And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death 
in order to present you before him holy and blameless and above reproach. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. As we jump into our text for this evening, it's important for us to remember uh, what, where we've come from in Colossians. In verse 10 of chapter 1, Paul issues a command to the Colossian believers to walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. In verses 13 and 14, Paul reminds us of the redemption that we have in the Son, that is Jesus Christ. It is he who we have redemption through the forgiveness of sin. And in verses 15 to 19, which is where we were last week, talking about the preeminence of the Son. Uh, He has preeminence over all of creation. And we see that in verses 15 to 17. And in verses 18 and 19, we see that the Son has preeminence over the new creation, that is the church. Specifically, zoning in on verse 19, we recognize that Paul is making a declaration of the deity of the Son of God. Paul, in explicit terms, is saying that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And this provides for us the foundation for which we will build uh, what we're going to learn tonight— It is based on the fact that Jesus is the preeminent one of all creation. It is based on the fact that Jesus is truly God, that we can have reconciliation through him. And so as we jump into our text for this evening, if you're taking notes, point number one, we must recognize God's plan of reconciliation. In verse 20, we see that it says that through him, this is the son, he will reconcile to himself all things. God's plan of reconciliation is Jesus Christ the Son. Period. God's plan of reconciliation consists of the sending of the Son of God. The major theme of these verses that we're going to see is this idea of reconciliation. Um, But for maybe some of you, maybe that word is is a little foreign. Maybe that's a word we don't use in our everyday vocabulary. And so just a helpful definition for this word reconciliation is the word to restore. It is to bring back to its proper place. It is to restore to the condition that it once had before it had fallen. And for you and for me, uh, ever since Genesis chapter 3 and the fall of man into sin, man has been in a state of corruption. A man has been in a a state plagued by a sinful nature. You'll recall uh, that back in Genesis chapter 3, God pronounces curses upon the serpent. He pronounces curses upon man and he pronounces curses upon the woman. And this is in light of their rebellion against God. A man, we, we ate from the fruit of the tree that God commanded Adam and Eve not to eat from. And from that point on, man was plunged into a sinful state. A sin had now entered into the world, and the world, as a result, was corrupted. And you'll recognize, even if we were to look at Genesis chapter 3 tonight, that the curses that God pronounces on the serpent and the man and woman don't end there. God also pronounces curses and judgment upon all of creation. Ever since the time of the fall, creation itself has not been what it was created to be. And in Romans chapter 8, verses 19 to 22, uh, Paul details how man's sin has subjected creation to futility. And so when Paul talks about this idea of reconciliation, there is in one sense a human component of it, But really, there's also a universal component to reconciliation. It is not just that Jesus in and of himself is going to be what restores man to God, but in a greater and larger sense, Jesus is what reconciles and restores all of creation. Jesus' death on the cross did so much more than just atone for sins, though it certainly did. The cross accomplished a restoration of, of the entire creation, both physical and spiritual. And we can see this even in Paul's language that he uses throughout chapter 1. We look at uh, verse 15, that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. 
And later on, we see that Paul uses this same language to talk about the difference between that which is fleshly or material and that which is spiritual. What Paul is talking about is that Jesus' reconciliation is universal. It encompasses everything in the material world that we see. It encompasses everything in the spiritual world that we do not see. Jesus' restoration is universal. It is complete. There is nothing lacking in it. And this is why even in verse 19, as we track back just a little bit, this is why in verse 19 it says that the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in the Son. Because the purpose of God, uh, the purpose of God's fullness in Christ is to reconcile the entire world and the entire creation to himself. As we think about this idea of reconciliation, uh, it's important to understand the necessity of it. It's important that we understand why there needs to be a restoration. What has been broken and, and what needs to be brought back, right? And so this brings us back to Genesis 3. This brings us back to man's fall into sin. And when God created, you and I know in chapter 1 and chapter 2 of Genesis, that when God created, he said it was good. And at the very end of his creation, God said it is very good. But after man falls into sin, this creation is no longer exactly what God created it to be. Yes, we still have the beauty of creation, and there are still wonderful things for us to behold, and yet creation is still subjected to the futility that occurred at the moment that sin entered into the world. And so we have to understand the necessity of reconciliation. Had Christ not come into the world, had the Father not sent the Son, there would be no restoration. There would for all of eternity be a rift, a gap, a, a chasm separating all of creation, including mankind, from God. Because God is a holy God. A God cannot allow sin to go unpunished. God must have atonement for sin. And this we see Christ accomplishing in his life. We see the Son being the means of bringing a, a fallen creation, fallen mankind, and bringing it and restoring it to God. As we recognize God's plan for reconciliation, it should stir our hearts. It should bring us to praise and to thanksgiving, for God desired that we would be restored to him. God had no obligation to do this. There was nothing that, in, that, that God had to do. There was no obligation for God to reconcile or to restore creation to himself. God was the one who was offended. God was the one who was sinned against. And yet, even though we think about this idea of reconciliation, really the, the one who should be the initiator, traditionally and typically, should be the one who is the offender. The, the guilty party is the one who is responsible to initiate and to begin the process of restoration. Maybe you remember this as, as a kid or maybe even this week. Maybe you and your brother or sister got into an argument or something and you wanted nothing. You didn't want to talk to your brother or sister. You didn't want to go to them and, and make amends for what happened. But your parents make you go and restore that relationship. But usually the one that is responsible to do that is the one who has been the offender, the one who has caused the offense, the one who is guilty. But in the case of God with man, it is God who initiates the restoration. It is God who not only initiates the reconciliation, but he is the one who accomplished it. And he accomplishes it through his son. This is cause for great praise and thanksgiving because you and I are unworthy and undeserving of a relationship with God. You and I deserve the just payment and the just judgment for our sin. But thanks be to God who did not leave us in our sin, but demonstrated his love for us in not only initiating but accomplishing a restoration, a reconciliation for us. Through the sending of the Son, God has shown that there is no limit, no length to which his love will not go to accomplish his plan of reconciliation. Romans 8.32 says, He who did not spare his own Son, but gave up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? 
And God has graciously given us all things through the Son. This is cause for great praise. A great worship is due God for what he has done for us in accomplishing reconciliation for us. This notion of reconciliation becomes even more apparent when we look at man's condition. When we understand man's true character and we understand his true state, this idea of reconciliation becomes so much more important to us. Which is why Paul then leads us into verse 21. If you're taking notes, our second point for the night is to realize that man is in desperate need of reconciliation. Verse 21 reads, And you, who were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. This is not a very good recommendation letter. You know, some of you who are in uh, upperclassmen, maybe you're a junior and senior, you're prepping for college, you'll ask maybe your teachers in school. Uh, some of you have even asked me for recommendation letters. And if this were to go on to a recommendation later, uh, it would be very difficult for you to get any position in any school. This commendation, or really it's a condemnation. And Paul says you are alienated, hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. What we see from verse 21 is that obviously the enmity that exists between God and man exists because of man's rebellion against God. Romans 5.12 says, there is, Therefore, there is a, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death passed to all men because all sinned. Uh, earlier in Romans 3, 10 and 12, Paul says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God, all have turned aside. Together, they have become worthless. There is none who does good, not even one. And so it is certainly the case that a man is separated from God because of initial sin and the sin of Adam and Eve, but it is also the result of our own sinfulness that we are separated from God. It is a result of sin that God is now only accessible through atonement. But it is not as though man is desirously longing for this reuniting and restoration with God. It is not though man is pleading and begging to be reconciled to God and God is unwilling. No, what Paul shows us here is that it is man who is hostile toward God. Man is in rebellion by his evil works. The alienation here in verse 21 is not due solely to God's disposition towards man's sin because of his holiness, but truly the result of man's love of his own sin and his hatred for God and his law. We see this word alienated. It's a, it's a strong word. It, it's a powerful word that, that, that describes a persistent and permanent condition of total separation. It is not as though there is some maybe uh, minor um, commonality between man and God. It is not as though it is a strained relationship. The language here is, is that of describing enemy forces. They have nothing in common. And then uh, coupled on top of this word, we have the word hostile. And this word hostile is added to the description of man's state. And it emphasizes man's feelings and man's disposition toward God. This description highlights that man is angry and bitter and animosity toward God. This animosity stems from a man's love for himself. It stems from a love for man's own flesh. And as we see in Scripture, God's law is in opposition to the flesh. And so there is this natural, in the natural fleshly man, there is this hatred toward God and his law because God's law condemns everything that is in the flesh. You see, this gap between man and God is not something that can easily be bridged. It is not something that can just be, oh, oh we'll shake hands and, and recognize our differences, but we'll be okay in the end. There is great hostility. There's great animosity, but recognize on whose part that is. In verse 20, we see God's plan of reconciliation through the Son. He initiates, he accomplishes. But in verse 21, who is it that is creating this, this gap? Who is it that's creating this division and this hostility? It is none other than man himself. 
is none other than you and I. In loving our own sin and hating the law of God, this is what causes the division. And it works itself out, Paul says, in the working of evil deeds. Man truly is in a desperate position. He is alienated from God, completely and totally separated. And this is by his own choosing. Not only this, but he's also incapable of making peace with God. This is why Christ is so necessary. Verse 20, Jesus is the one who makes peace. We need this mediator between God and man. Not only does man need reconciliation, but he needs to respond rightly to reconciliation. The only right response to all that God has done in the Son is to respond with repentance and belief. Repentance is turning away from everything that is displeasing to God. That's all that your sin, all your living according to your flesh, and turning to obedience to Christ and his law and his word. This is the only right response. This is the only way that you can be reconciled to God. And I'm under no delusion. I'm underneath no uh, deceit that there are people in this room tonight who verse 21, sadly, is a description of their lives. Maybe not on the outside. Many of you have grown up in the church. Your parents take you to church ever since the time you were a little kid. You've grown up in the church hearing the truth week in, week out. You know the facts of the gospel better than most. That Jesus was born of a virgin, lived a perfect sinless life. At the age of 33, he died on the cross for sins and three days later rose from the grave. You know these things. You've been taught them from the time you were young. And maybe on the outside, you're really good about putting on this Christian mask. And to everybody else, maybe you seem like you are a Christian. But in your heart of hearts, there is animosity and hostility toward the things of God. Because deep down, you love what you love, and that is yourself. You love your sin. You don't want anybody to tell you what to do or who to be or how to act. You want to be your own person. And you would love nothing more than to remove any kind of accountability to God. It's hard to say, but that probably is the definition of some in this room tonight. Maybe that's you. Maybe in your heart you truly do not love God, but instead you love yourself and only want to do what is pleasing to you. You think that if as soon as I turn 18 and I'm gone and mom and dad can't tell me what to do anymore, I'm going to go and live my life, I'm going to do it my way, and I'm going to do what I want, and I'm not going to think twice about God. All God is is a cosmic killjoy, and he just wants me to be sad, he doesn't want me to have fun, doesn't want me to do what I want to do. And in your mind, you have this idea that if you were just to get away from God and his law, that would be real freedom. If I can just go out and do what I want to do, I'll be free. Friend, you are sorely misled. The culture in this world tries to paint the picture that you can be free and you can do whatever you want. You can live according to the law of only one person, and that is yourself. This is a lie. This is a lie from the devil. And he wants you to believe it. He wants you to to buy it. But the reality is, is that you have never been free for one day in your life. You are always a slave of something or of someone. Paul describes it this way in Romans chapter 6, that you are either a slave of sin and your flesh, or you're either a slave of righteousness. Maybe you don't like that word slave. Use the word servant. That's okay. You're either serving your flesh, serving your sinful nature, or you're serving Christ and righteousness. There is no... uh, Uh, autonomy. There is no ability for you to be a one person removed and not accountable to anyone. You absolutely will forever, and from the day you have been born until the day you die, be the servant of something or someone. Jesus says in John chapter 8 that true freedom is found in serving him. You are maybe, you think for yourself, well, no, if I am just living for me, then that's real freedom. The reality is, is no, this is no freedom at all. 
If you talk to anyone who's addicted to alcohol or drugs or any kind of addictive behavior, ask them if they're free. Ask them if they're free and they'll tell you, yes, I am free. I do what I want. But I tell you in truth, they are slaves to their own bodies. If you were to ask them, prove to me, prove to yourself that you're not enslaved. Go a month without X, Y, or Z, fill in the blank. Go a month without this behavior. And I guarantee you they won't be able to do it. Because they are enslaved, they are ensnared by whatever that addictive behavior is. For you, maybe it's not that outright. Maybe it's not that obvious. But try to deny yourself. Try to deny your own flesh without being in Christ, and you can't do it. Because you are a slave of your own flesh. You are a slave of your own passions and desires. This is not true freedom. The devil and the world and the culture would love to tell you that this is freedom, but it's not. And because God's word comes in and says, you are not free, you are a slave, we buck against that. And we hate that. Because we don't want anyone telling us what to do. We don't want to be accountable to anybody. This is what causes the animosity. This is what causes the hostility of mind toward God and his word. Friend, if that's you in here tonight, I beg and I plead with you. I can say no more than what the Apostle Paul says, be reconciled to God. You are not free. You are enslaved to your flesh. True freedom is only found in placing your faith and obedience to the Son. This is true freedom. Following after him is what real freedom is. And so we need to realize man's desperate need for reconciliation. But in verse 22, we also see that we need to remember that Christ's death was the means of reconciliation. In verse 20, we saw that the Son of God is the agent of reconciliation. But here in verse 22, we see that he is also the means of reconciliation. And the means of reconciliation truly is the death of the Son. Read verse 22 with me. He has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Jesus' body provides the means of atonement. And this is why it's so important that Christ not be just God, but he also be man. As a man, Christ was able to die. And as God, Christ was pleasing to God and a sufficient and infinite sacrifice for sin. Christ needed to become a man because only a man could die for sin. The payment or atonement for sin is death and God cannot die. And so this is why even last week we talked about this term, the hypostatic union. Jesus has one, he is one person with two natures, both the human and the divine. And it is absolutely necessary that Jesus was both truly God and truly man because only a man can die and death is the price to be made so that we might be reconciled to God. So as Christ took upon himself a body, he took it up solely for the purpose of fulfilling all righteousness. That's Matthew 5.20. To, to fulfill all righteousness and then also to lay his body down as this price for atonement. And by his death, Jesus accomplished all salvation for all that the Father had given to him. In John 17, chapter 2, Jesus says, I have not lost one of those whom you have given me. These that the Father has given to the Son, uh, chosen to be in the Son before the foundation of the world, Jesus has justified and made them positionally righteous. So that when they on judgment day stand before God, they are not seen by their, their guilty works and their sinful deeds, but they are seen by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And even now, in the present day, Christ is sanctifying them so that they might become holy and blameless and above reproach. I want us to focus in, in verse 22, on this word, in order to present you. And this idea of presentation is one that flows all throughout Scripture. And what really we come to find out is that reconciliation is not really just about us. We are certainly the beneficiaries of reconciliation, but it is not all about us. 
You see, the purpose of this sanctification, this presentation of uh, bringing us, making us holy and blameless and above reproach is so that Jesus might present his chosen ones, the church, to the Father. This is in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26 and 27. Turn there with me quickly and we'll, we'll look at this verse. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 26 and 27, it says, uh, Jesus is sanctifying the church that he might sanctify the church having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present, there's that word again, the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and blameless without blemish. Again, in 1 Corinthians 15, 27 and 28, uh, it says, For God has put all things in subjection under the Son's feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all and all. Friends, this is God's goal of reconciliation right here. The Father gives the Son. 1 John 4.14 says the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Then, in response, the Son willingly submits, obeys perfectly, and redeems. We see this in Philippians 2, 6 to 8. But God, but the Son, who is in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but took upon himself the form of a servant. Being found in human form, he is obedient even to the point of death, death on a cross. And then in response to this uh, perfect obedience and this uh, redemption that the Son accomplishes, then the Father exalts the Son and gives him preeminence over creation in the church. This is what we talked about last week in Philippians 2, 9 to 11. The Father uh, gives and bestows upon the Son the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And then after this, after the, the Father uh, exalts the Son, then the Son goes about the business of cleansing and purifying these people that the Father has given him in order to present them to the Father as a holy people who will then go on to worship him for all of eternity. This is God's goal of reconciliation. It's not about you and me. Oh, oh man, are we the gracious and, and are we the undeserving recipients of the wonderful reconciliation that God has accomplished? Yes, amen and amen. But God's goal in reconciliation is far greater than just you and I, and I want you to see that. Because in all of eternity past, before the creation of the world, before the foundations of the world were laid, a God in the Trinity, in perfect unity and love, came up with the plan of reconciliation and the plan of redemption. That the Son would go and be that which uh, redeems mankind to the Father. The Father then would elevate and exalt the Son, and then the Son would purify and sanctify people who have been exposed to the grace, the mercy, the love, the compassion, all the attributes of the Father, getting to experience His fullness so that in all of eternity we might be able to worship Him so much greater. Can you see it? Do you understand? You and I are a loved gift from the Son to the Father. You and I are going to be, and our purpose in all of eternity is to worship God in light of the grace and the mercy that we have seen and witnessed in Him through the Son. This is God's goal of reconciliation. We are being prepared to be a gift and love offering from the Son to the Father. This is the great story of redemptive history. This is the great story of reconciliation. And I'm just overwhelmed by it. I hope you are too. This is phenomenal stuff. You and I are just so small. We're specks of dust. And yet, this is why maybe even the psalmist in Psalm 8 says, Who is man that you are mindful of him? But God considers us, and he loves us, and he demonstrates his love to us, and we get to be the beneficiaries of amazing grace. We, though we don't deserve it at all, get to be reconciled to God as part of a love gift from the Son to the Father. And so how do we respond to this? 
how do we understand this and then how do we use this knowledge to affect our lives? Well, I think it's obvious at the end of verse 22. If Jesus is preparing us to present us, how is he preparing us? He's preparing us to be what? Oh, I'm still in Ephesians. He's preparing us to be holy and blameless and above reproach. If this is what Jesus is preparing us to be, then it rightly follows that we ought to be pursuing these things. We ought to be, as Paul says in verse 10, walking worthy. We ought to be walking worthy of the manner by which we have been saved. Walking worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Walking worthy of the demonstrated love of God through him. This is how we are called to live. This is what Christ is preparing us for. And so this is how we ought to live. We ought to live constantly desiring to be holy and blameless and above reproach. Dying to the deeds of the flesh, those things that were causing us to be alienated from God, and living to those things that draw us to be pleasing to God. We've talked in weeks past that the only way that we're pleasing to God is being like Christ. Matthew 3.17, the Father speaks from heaven, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. We can be pleasing to the Father by emulating it the model and example of the Son. And so we see in verse 22 that we need to remember that Christ's death was the means of our reconciliation. It was the pivotal point of all of uh, redemptive history that Jesus would accomplish salvation. He would accomplish reconciliation for us. Well, this brings us to verse 23, and Paul changes his, his tune a little bit. It's been glorious and, and magnificent. Paul speaks in cosmic and universal language. But then in verse 23, he issues a stern and sober reminder. You and I must remain steadfast in our love for God. If you're taking notes, point four, we must remain steadfast in our love for God. We are presented holy and blameless and above reproach before him if you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. In this verse, Paul is not trying to indicate that there is any ability for you to lose your salvation. Instead, what he is saying is because of the immensity and the glorious privilege to be found in Christ, he is calling believers to make their calling and election sure. He is calling these uh, Colossian believers to make sure they are in the faith. When we think about this idea of continuance and, and steadfastness in the gospel, really what it truly is, is it's not uh, that some people get saved but then fall away. It is that the gospel truly hasn't taken root in their life. The continuance in the gospel is merely the evidence that the gospel has truly taken root in you. Any who fall away, well, these might be like the seeds in the parable that Jesus gives. Those that fall among the, the rocky soil, those that fall among the thorny soil, uh, they sprout up for a little time. They maybe even look like they are prospering, but for one reason or another, whether it's the love of the world or maybe it's the, the persecution that arises for being a follower of Christ, they fall away. And they fall away because they did not have a firm root. That's what these words, stable and steadfast, that's what they're describing. It's really just a description of the root of the gospel in someone's life. If the gospel has firmly taken root in your heart and your mind, you will not live according to your flesh. Maybe not perfectly, but the trajectory of your life is no longer, I want to live for me. And I don't care what God's law says. Instead, if the gospel has truly taken root in your life, and you understand this amazing truth that God demonstrates his love for those who were his enemies by giving of his only son who would die in their place and accomplish redemption and salvation for them, if you truly understand and believe that, you're no longer going to want to be living in opposition to God's word. You're going to be wanting to live in a way that's pleasing to him. You're going to be wanting to live in a way that is in accordance with what he commands. Even uh, Romans 8, verses 6 and 7 say, For the mind that is set on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. 
And so the person who is stable and steadfast, the one who's not shifting away from the gospel that they have heard, it is not because they have any more ability to grit their teeth or be able to withstand things on their own power. It is because the truth of the gospel has taken firm root in their life. It is that they understand it and they believe it. And God has done a work of restoration in their lives. A part of the purification process verse 22 talks about, right? If Jesus is going to present us holy and blameless and above reproach, it is absolutely necessary that we do not stay in the same condition that we were in when we were first saved. Can I get an amen? It is absolutely necessary for you and I to be changed and to be transformed from the life that we once lived according to the flesh to be living in a way that is now pleasing to God. And the way that God does this is by bringing different things into our lives to weed out the, the bad character, to weed out the bad practices, and to help instill in us good things and good works that are pleasing to God. This may come in the shape of trials. This may come in the shape of suffering. This may just come through the hardships that are uh, coming your way because of the sinful state that this world is in and that we don't live in a perfect world. But for one reason or another, if you truly are in Christ— this, the suffering that you experience in this life and the trials that you endure uh, don't make you want to go away from Christ, but help you get more firmly planted in him. This is what Paul is talking about. And this is truly because of the love that we have for God because of what he has done for us. This is why it's so important for us to get the gospel right. This is why it's so important for us to know what we believe. This is why it's so important for us to understand what God's goal of reconciliation is. Brothers, sisters, it is absolutely true that Jesus died to save sinners, of which you and I are chief. You and I are unworthy of the restoring and reconciling love of the Father. We're unworthy of the death and body and blood of the Son. We are unworthy to be partakers of the inheritance that will be given to the Son. We are unworthy to be called the children of God and yet all of it has been graciously given to us. The only right response then is for us to walk worthy. It's for us to endure the trials and sufferings of this life with great joy and satisfaction that we get to do these things, that we know that God is working in us our purification, our sanctification. God is working in us, making you holy and blameless and above reproach so that one day you can be presented before the Father as holy worshipers for him for all of eternity. The underlying theme of these four verses is reconciliation. Reconciliation not just of man, but also of all creation. And God has, as we've seen, accomplished reconciliation through the Son. His death was the means of accomplishing it. Man needs to be reconciled to God. We're alienated and hostile in our own ways. We need to be repentant of our sin and all that is causing this hostility toward God. Indeed, all of creation will one day be reconciled to God in the end. Scripture tells us this much. The only those who are going to be reconciled with all of creation in the end are those who have turned away from their sin, turned from all that is creating this hostility toward God and living in obedience to him, repentant of sin, believing only in the death and resurrection of the Son as the means of reconciling. God wants you to be reconciled. And he gave his only Son as a demonstration of his desire for you to be reconciled to him. So I can do no better. I can't add to the words of the Apostle Paul. He says, I implore you on behalf of Christ... Be reconciled to God. This is my prayer for each and every one of you in this room. If you are reconciled to God, be pursuing holiness that you might be blameless and above reproach. But if in your heart you fit the description of verse 21, you're alienated from God, hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, I beg and I plead, be reconciled with God. If you have any questions about how to do that, your small group leader can help you. You can come see me. I'd be more than happy to talk to you about how you can be reconciled to God. But it is your greatest need. Before any other need, is your greatest need is to be restored to and brought back into right relationship with God. Be reconciled to God. Let us pray together. Father, what marvelous truths are ours in the gospel.
What marvelous reality is that in, even in all of eternity past, it was your desire to redeem and restore a chosen people to you that we might be before you holy and blameless. Though man rebelled against you, you demonstrated your love and the sending of the Son and the accomplishing of salvation through his death and resurrection. I pray that if there's anyone in this room who is hostile toward you because they love their sin and hate your law because it condemns their sin, that they would repent of all that dishonors you, that they would recognize their need for salvation, recognize their need of reconciliation, and that they would turn to you in in belief and faith in the Son and his work of reconciliation on the cross. We pray that you bless the discussions of our small groups, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys are dismissed to small groups.